Um, so I'm going to turn over. There you go. I'm going to turn over the computer to Sarah to introduce the event. Hi. Hi. Oh, I feel very close to everyone out there. Um, <laughs> hi, everybody, and thanks for being with us tonight. My name's Sarah, and I'm the mother of a five-year-old SM daughter. Earlier this year, my daughter stopped speaking to more and more people. She already had a limited number that she spoke with, and it became fewer and fewer. In August of this year, she stopped speaking to everybody, even my husband and me. We had never heard of selective mutism before August, and we were living abroad in a place that didn't have an SM expert. We were frantically looking for someone who could diagnose her, but more importantly, to give us um, information and guidance what to do. We looked online, found websites, and called all the major um, centers specializing in selective mutism across the country. And we spoke to very nice people who gave us appointments two weeks, three weeks, a few months in the future. At the same time, I emailed um, Kurtz Psychology, and Dr. Kurtz answered me that day, realizing the situation we were in and realizing the severity. Um, he called me two days later on his weekend. Actually, when I called you, you were doing a Brave Buddies um, uh, course. He was so busy, and I mean, he, he took the time, and, and we've been with him ever since. Um, so in August, my husband and I received guidance from Dr. Kurtz on how to reduce my daughter's anxiety and reward her with no pressure to speak. After that, we learned what to do and what not to do about selective mutism. In September, we started web chats from abroad with my daughter and Dr. Kurtz. We also learned from Dr. Kurtz how to do exposures, and we lead a very serious exposure lifestyle. By November um, this month, my daughter was vocal almost everywhere except for school. It was a big change in a short time. We asked Dr. Kurtz to come and work with her in our school this week. So this week he gave a training to about 50 teachers and staff in, our, in this amazing school district. And then he spent yesterday and today um, with my daughter in all of her kindergarten classes. Remarkably, she has talked in every class. And he's exhausted. And he's exhausted, yeah. She's not, she's very excited. <laughs> she's wide awake. Um, she's talked in all her classes, answering multiple questions from multiple teachers, and talking to her peers. Talking to her peers was the absolute hardest thing she could imagine doing, and she's doing it with ease? Yes. With ease. With ease. Um, um, she said it was easy. Um, we know this rate of change is not typical, and we still have a, a ways to go. Anyway, what I want to say is in these short few months, with amazing guidance from Dr. Kurtz, our, daughter, our daughter's life has changed dramatically for the future, um, or for the better. And with, with this type of support, we wish this type of support was available to everyone. We, we know how lucky we are to, to have gotten this support. Um, that's why we have this special guest with us here tonight in the North Shore Library of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, we are firm believers in the exposure lifestyle, and we can't wait to hear more from Dr. Kurtz. Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so time is precious. Uh, I'm gonna just jump right in. Um, so I've been here in Milwaukee for a couple of days, and I've been with some folks here in this library starting a discussion. Um, usually at these kind of events, people are very gracious in using my name a lot. I really want to make sure that I'm talking about an approach and not necessarily about Kurtz and Kurtz psychology, but about what psychologists who do clinical research know works based on evidence. And I feel like our responsibility is to funnel that information out. Um, so in one hour, this so it's hard to focus on one thing, but I did want to focus on this thing called an exposure lifestyle. Um, so there's a, a prompt that the folks online see that says, how confident are you uh, that you know what an SM exposure is? So by show of hands here, give me a thumbs up if you're very confident and thumbs down if you're not very confident. So we're mostly, we're mostly not confident. We're about half and half. Um, your kids' lives depend on you being confidently able to do this. So we're gonna really dive into exposure uh, exposure lifestyle. Um, what you're up against is the number of times that your kids have gotten to practice 
not responding verbally through no fault of your own and through no fault of theirs. If I were to estimate today alone, I would say that the girl I was with, the kindergarten girl I was with probably had 150 opportunities, prompts from peers and teachers to verbally interact. Let, let's say I'm wrong, let's just say it's 100. And let's just say there's five days in a school week, so that's 500. And let's say it's uh, 2,500 times in a school year. 25,000 times, not 2,500 times. That's a lot of practice. If you practice a golf swing badly 25,000 times, you'll get really good at a really bad golf swing. So whatever you practice, whether you practice it good or bad, that you're going to perfect that technique. So by the time many of your kids come into treatment, they're better at not responding than you are at prompting responding. Um, I often do this when I'm training. I'll say to people, ask me when my birthday is, and I'll stare at you. And I know from experience, in two and a half seconds, you're, you're uncomfortable with the stare coming back at you. And so your kids are better at it than you are. So they need, if you take, I, I realize it's a fairly reductionist kind of way of thinking about this, but they need so many experiences of being trained to respond to overcome all the experiences they've had of not responding. Think about how weird it is. You, you wake up, like some parents are out here tonight and they're going to kind of get the, the zeitgeist. They're going to get the idea that we've got to do exposure lifestyle. And then tomorrow morning, they're going to start trying to do it. And for the kids, it's like, wait a second. I don't remember voting on this. I, I almost think of it like changing religions. Like, hey, I got good news. Now we're Orthodox at whatever your religion is. You know, now we're devout Catholics. Now we're Orthodox Jews. It's like you're, you're going to all of a sudden change your lifestyle. But you got to do it. I'll talk with you tonight about, I think, how to do it intelligently and gradually. But you got to do it. Um, I'll start with my thesis and then hopefully come back to it. I would argue that if you're not doing four, five, six exposures a day, meaning four, five, six times a day, that you're specifically prompting and guiding a successful verbal interaction. It might be just this much more verbal than it was yesterday, but something more Then you're not giving your kid a high enough dose of the therapy. You think about therapy as the thing you go to on Wednesdays at four o'clock. I think about the therapy as the thing, excuse me, that you do each and every day with them at the library, at the bakery, at the cleaners, at the gas station, at the gym, at pickup, at drop off, at the play date, at Thanksgiving, at Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever you have coming up if you celebrate. So I would maintain that you got to be doing four, five, six exposures a day, and that by 7.30 at night, 6.30 at night, I, you ought to be able to tell me what they were. I'm not going to put you on the spot because you're here to learn about this, but I think that's where I, I hope to sort of end up with this uh, discussion. Um, your kids are sort of contaminated and have difficulty talking to certain people in certain situations and doing certain activities. And what we need to do is one at a time build up the people, the places, and the activities that they're successful. And it's always going to start with rehearsing at home. What I hope you leave with tonight is a really good understanding about what, uh, what a successful exposure is. I'm playing with these poles on my hand. Okay. Um, you're in aisle three of the supermarket. And somebody comes up and says, hi, sweetie, what, whose class are you in this year? And sweetie runs behind your pants or your skirt. They're getting a false alarm about danger. And the first time you rescue them, it's totally understandable and it's loving and it's, it's understandable. Uh, but unfortunately, that rescue reinforces them for using that coping skill of avoiding. It also kind of reinforces you for rescuing them because all of a sudden you both feel bad. I mean, less bad with the rescue. And now somebody like me talking about exposure therapy is talking about purposely going back to aisle three of the supermarket and knowing you're going to feel uncomfortable. So many of you know our motto is get comfortable being uncomfortable. I found out 
today that I've been wearing this pin upside down for three days, but my host thought I was doing it on purpose, <laughs> which makes sense, it makes perfect sense. Uh, but that's what we're doing. An exposure lifestyle when it's there, leaves kids knowing that you are relentless in doing these exposures. Relentlessly loving, not relentlessly mean. So when my five-year-old kid yesterday in the library dug her heels in, I'm not picking a book, I'm not picking a book. She was serious. And I had to be more serious than she was. And if I told you that she went home and burned the book or threw it out or kicked the dog, then you would have reason to think this is a stupid therapy. But if I told you that, I, that when we went home at the end of the day, she took the book off the table and started reading it on her own and then sat me down in the living room as if she was the teacher and did a reading of the book with her dad's help because she's not yet a reader. But she took that same book that she was damning me for uh, and read it as if she's the teacher or the school librarian. That to me is the proof positive of the value of an exposure lifestyle. But the school counselor who was in the room in the library with me when this was going on probably was ready to call child abuse. I mean, wouldn't you? I don't know. Um, so an exposure by definition is uh, something you do that expands your where your kid is at. It, it stretches them a little bit. An exposure by definition has to be in the context of a fun, trusting, relationship so you have to practice having fun with your kids um, many of you know our, our web course course selective mutism learning .org, um, and there are videos to kind of model for you how to make sure you get in your special time every day it's especially important for therapists to do because we don't already have a positive relationship with your child exposures by definition start small and build up exposures by definition can be done at as conservative a pace as you think you need to do to keep your child progressing. If you're me and you know how to do exposures really well, I'm gonna move along at a faster pace than you probably will, and that's fine. There's a concept in football. I'm here in Cheesehead territory, what is it? Where the, the Badgers and the Packers. So in football, we have this thing called forward motion. As long as there's forward motion, the play is still going, the, the play is not dead. The, it could be going a foot an hour, but as long as there's forward motion, we're in play. And that to me is what exposures are meant to be. Just keep it going, it doesn't matter how small the increment is. But you have to have a vision in your head of what the increments are, and we'll play around with that and talk, talk about that a little bit. Um, exposures by definition increase approach. The only thing Sarah said that I would disagree with about my approach is that I was working with her daughter to lower anxiety. I wasn't working with your daughter to lower anxiety. You were. You were. You. But we I'm. In the first week before we yes. started with you. We so, had to lower her before we started. Because of the special circumstance yes. of not yes. talking to parents at the time. But my larger teaching point is we're not targeting lower anxiety. We're targeting doing more approach behavior. If you keep approaching, the anxiety will likely take care of itself. It, I say likely because it always has, but maybe I'll treat a kid someday who still doesn't lessen their anxiety, but they're able to give a book report and they're able to go for a job interview and they're able to go for the driver's test. Where I come from, that still would be progress and probably where you come from too. But I'm just telling you based on experience, it's never happened that way. The anxiety always lowers over time. Psychologists call that habituation which is a, a very interesting kind of concept. Exposures require with kids that you use points, incentives, rewards. It just does. Um, I've argued with other psychologists about it, and you can read controversies around praise and points and prizes. If you have typical, neurotypically developing kids that don't need points and prizes to do these huge tasks, God bless. Mm -hmm. But you all need that for your kids. I can promise you, based on experience, based on my read of the literature, no kid has ever become addicted to the points and prizes. Ever. Um, today, most of the time that I was helping the student do her exposures, we, I wasn't carrying around a point sheet. 
and it was no big deal. You kind of know when you don't need to do it each and every time, but in the beginning, you kind of need to do it each and every time. When you do an exposure, you know it's a good one if you get a little bit of pushback. Otherwise, it's not really an exposure. It's a new habit. Like, I'm not disappointed that the student I was working with today was able to go out at recess and talk with her friends just fine. I couldn't create an exposure that she needed. So, I mean, that's just fine. But usually when you're doing exposures, you're going to get some pushback, and that's a sign that you're on the right track. Do you know what your kid's job is when you're doing an exposure? Their job is to convince you that you're killing them, <laughs> that you're murdering them, that you're maiming them, that it's child abuse, that it's torture, and that you're really mean. That's their job. And your job is to just absorb it and know you're doing the right thing. And you may decide that the specific exposure you've prompted is more than they can handle. And that's when we're going to talk about a, a plan B. But their job is to convince you to back off that you're killing them, and your job is to stay the course. So plan B means that you do something that lowers the degree of difficulty, but allows you to save face and allows them to be successful. So an example might be um, you are having difficulty if we're doing morning meeting for younger kids. And I say, uh, do you think today is Tuesday or Wednesday? And you look at me during the headlights. It might be that you and whoever you're doing the exposure with goes in the hallway to practice and then comes back and tells us. I was ready at one point to actually do that. I didn't need to because the, when the child was represented with the question, in a slightly different way, she was able to verbalize it. When something like this, um, what two foods do you like together? Now, that's a fairly complicated question for a five-year-old. It's also fairly difficult if you have difficulty, in addition to SM, expressing opinions or choices. But when the teacher rephrased it after waiting the appropriate five seconds that we call for in our paradigm, to what do you like with hamburgers? Do you like french fries or I forget what the other choice was. And she answered, I think french fries, whatever it was. But I was ready to go out in the hallway and practice. So once you've teed up an exposure, there has to be some way to recover it. And it's okay to move back and regain momentum. And my default setting is to always move back to the last thing they were successful at, the last question the last prompt. Um, a good exposure always ends on a positive note. Whenever I talk about this and whenever I do it, I think about when my 34-year-old and 30-year-old children were young and I'd come home from work and we'd have a catch in the backyard and I'd throw them pop-ups. You always want to end on a caught ball. You can't go into dinner on a, on a missed fly ball. So you got to do what you got to do to make it successful. You know, every once in a while, will you run out of time? Yeah, maybe. But that's kind of my default setting for exposures. Um, I don't think I talked about our four-part mantra since we went live. All right. So I'm going to give you four things to write down that put together are going to be a very useful tool. And I'm going to credit my uh, colleague and friend, Ellie Lebowitz, who's up at Yale, who worked with parents of kids with OCD who was so severe that either they refused to come for treatment, it's hard to treat somebody who refuses to come to treatment, or they'd actually had good behavior therapy and didn't get better. So a pretty severe group. And he worked only through the parents, which is kind of interesting because I worked through the parents a lot. So this is kind of paraphrasing something he, he does with parents where he has them like write letters to the kids about expectations. So here's my four part mantra. One, I love you very much. Or if you're with a partner, we love you very much. We know it's really hard for you to blank. It might be to say the day of the week. It might be to choose what to wear tomorrow to school. It might be to answer grandma when she says um, whatever question she says. So we love you very much. We know it's very hard for you to blank but I'm confident you can blank. And the second blank has to be a subset of the thing they were having difficulty doing. So I know it's really hard for you to say the day of the week in front of your whole class, but I'm confident you can do it with me in the back of the class with nobody around. 
And part four is, and I'm going to help you by blanking. I'm going to help you by rehearsing at home. I'm going to help you by bringing your point chart. I'm going to help you by pre-selecting your prize that you know you're working towards. And taken together, that's a really useful tool and strategy. So I call it the four-part mantra, and I credit Ellie Lebowitz for uh, uh, kind of putting that together. Um, rewards, to be effective, need to be small and frequent as opposed to large and infrequent. One of the worst rewards I ever let a family negotiate with their child was an 8,000 piece Lego set, <laughs> which when the kid finally earned it, he was totally, totally frustrated with it. And so it was a punisher, not a reward. Um, he was at the time the most severe kid I had treated. He had stopped talking to his parents. I want you to know that he's now a freshman at a very, very, uh, prestigious school. He did a senior thesis on uh, selective mutism research in part working with us. Uh, he's been a counselor in our program um, and he's doing fine. He was also on the largest dose of medicine of any kid I've ever worked with and now he's not on medicine. So among the things I hope you take away, those who are here and those watching on Facebook, if you stick with the program, your kids are going to get better. They really, really will. The older they get when they start treatment of, a, of this type, the harder it is. That's true. But harder doesn't mean impossible. Okay, so that's the role of rewards. So I'm going to describe to you what I think you should have with you. And I'm, again, I'm not going to put you on the spot because it's not like you took this course a year ago and now is the post-test. But here's what I think you need to have with you. I think you need to have a small bag with you. And... Western culture, some of you might call that a pocketbook or something like that, a knapsack. And in that bag, I think you need to have a dry erase board or a piece of paper. I think if you have a dry erase board, you need to have a dry erase marker or paper and pen. I think you have, need to have some kind of point tracker. It could be a piece of paper with circles on it. I'm not talking about anything more complicated than this, so that as your kids are earning their points, you simply put checks in the box. Um, your carrying kit would have three to five games that are slam dunk for your child, meaning three to five games that you know from experience, they like playing with you, that you've practiced at home. For younger kids, it's things like Spotted and Guess Who and Uno and a favorites game, Travel Battleship. For older kids, there might be other, other activities. But in that purse, in that knapsack, is three to five things you pull out that are slam dunk for them to be verbalizing with you. In a really kind of cool psychological way, kind of jargony way, the games take on this thing we call stimulus control value. You're driving down the street, you see a yellow light What's and while you're driving. What are you predisposed to do when you see the yellow light? Sir, slow down. Slow down. That's if you're a good driver. <laughs> um, if you see a red light, what are you predisposed to do? To stop, right? So the games take on that same kind of predictive value. If I say grandma's tuna fish, for me, it automatically is a positive association. For you, it might be a horrible association. I don't know. But we want those games to be in your backpack or your purse so that when you take them out, your kids have an expectation of what's going to follow. And you ought to have either the prizes that they're working for or the promise of prizes they're working for. So the student I went with to school these past couple of days had a piece of paper with photos of a menu of about 12 prizes that she could be working towards. And as soon as she filled up the first sheet, she circled which prize she wanted. And as soon as she got home, she got that prize. And it was a gnome with candy in it. Simple, easy, timely, um, and, valu and valuable to her. Can you think of some reasons why we would and wouldn't want to use a whiteboard with kids with selective mutism? To write. Like if they right. write their responses, right. then what we're doing is actually the opposite of therapy. Mm -hmm. yes. So the reason I want a whiteboard is so that you can give other people questions on the whiteboard to ask your child that you've been rehearsing with them. So for example, 
I go to an ice cream store and I give the clerk behind the counter uh, the whiteboard and it has five questions on it. What flavor do you want? Vanilla, chocolate, or something else? Do you want a cup or a cone? Do you want sprinkles or no sprinkles? Do you want rainbow sprinkles or chocolate sprinkles? Whipped cream or no whipped cream? I've rehearsed those questions, that script, that way with my patient so that the whiteboard allows me to give it to the clerk and be successful. And we'll talk more about how to even break that down more, but that's the, the role of a whiteboard. Um, I also did it when I went to a pet store with a kid and I wanted to give her a question to read to the person. We haven't talked about eye contact, but eye contact is like the la I think, the last bastion of control of the intensity of a relationship that we can have. If I'm forced to give you eye contact, it's, it's kind of more threatening for kids. If I can be reading something, it gives me some way to lower the intensity of the interaction. Does that make sense? Um, there's just a few published randomized control trials of therapy that helps kids with SM. One of them was the Norwegians, and they published a, a, an approach that they called defocused communication. And what I loved about it was that it captured that you don't want the therapy situation or the prompt situation to be me staring at you. If you're co-constructing together or you're able to look at something else, then it just kind of lowers the threat value. Ask me, how many kids do I have that are completely verbal but require a piece of paper between them and the other person? Ask me. None. So nobody ends up being dependent on it. It's a step along the way that allows a lowered intensity. I tend to ask a lot of these fairly rhetorical questions. So that's the recipe kit. That's the kit I hope you have with you. Um, if your child had diabetes, you would always have with you your blood testing equipment and your insulin and your glucagon and your emergency uh, glucose. And you would never give me as an excuse, it was a busy day, <clears throat> I had a headache. You just, that's your, that's your life commitment. I work with families and parents to try to get them to have that same approach about their exposure kit. Your child getting out of their SM requires <clears throat> multiple exposures a day. And so you have to be kind of always on the lookout for where in the world you're gonna do that. When I do parent training for a summer intensive, um, when we meet at 9.30, I know they've already had several opportunities. They had the doorman at the hotel. They had the waiter at breakfast. They had my staff downstairs at the, at the lobby. They had the security guard. That's four right there. They have the taxi drivers, five. So it's really being vigilant to build into your time with your kids um, fairly constant exposures. And then that's what we call an exposure lifestyle. Um, I thought I would give you some examples of some hierarchies that, that I've gone through. Um, I had a girl once, she was uh, I think six when I met her, talking to me in my office first session. Figured, awesome, this is gonna be easy street. Happened to live in my town, I went to her home for the next session, go into her house, played the same fabulous game in her home that we played in my office. That's what Kurt says to do, so I did it. I'm Kurt, get it? Uh, and she stopped talking to me and stopped talking to her parent in her own home and only whispered to her mom on the second floor of their house. I did what I would suggest you do, which is you take the hit for having misestimated, wrongly estimated what they're ready to do. So I said, sweetie, clearly I didn't give us enough practice at my office. I'm gonna leave, I'll meet you back in my office. We'll have more fun getting to know each other there. We'll build your brave muscles. And then when we're ready, I'll come back to your house. Went back, it was probably one session, maybe it was two. Went back with the game to her house, but this time I got smarter. I had she and her mom playing the game in their house. As I was coming in, I said, when I came in, I need to do some work on my phone while you guys play, just to create a diversion so that they could play in my presence. As the child kept talking, I came half the distance, then half the distance, half the distance, and did the same thing with her friend the next week. Had the friend wait in the kitchen, which was down the hall. As the kid was playing the game with me now without her mom, 
I had her come half the distance, then we played the game cards together. Then I said something like, I don't know, I have to go to the bathroom or I have to text or I'm getting a call, whatever, and kind of passed the baton to the child. Then we went uh, and changed the game. Then we changed the game and took it to a playground. So each step, we're changing one variable at a time. If you change two variables at a time, like the location, who's playing the game and the game, you're setting yourselves up for failure and your kids can't tolerate much more failure than they've had. They need successes only. And that's a way to try and ensure it. Insurance doesn't guarantee things. It just changes probabilities of things. Um, we went from playing those games outside their classroom to playing those same three games inside the classroom at a table. Then we went from the games at the table to the morning meeting rug. I rehearsed them in morning meeting. Then I had the parent and the teacher in the side of the room while we did morning meeting. Then I had the teacher join me for the morning meeting. Then I had myself step out. And all of that probably over the course of about seven or eight sessions. For a kid who was on the severe end, seemed like a pretty good rate of progress. But that's using an exposure lifestyle. So all the time we're moving forward and it's doing it smartly by having small increments. That's kind of a, a peer exposure. I remember once I went to help a 10 year old girl talk to her best friend for the first time. I'm a lucky guy. I get to like be at these life changing moments. And you guys as parents of kids with SM can understand that a kid could have a best friend even though they've never ever ever spoken to them. Most people find that kind of weird, but so what? So I've done all the stuff that Kurt says to do. I'm Kurt, so I knew what to do. And it came time for the friend to be there and popped the first question in front of her and my patient just completely shut down. I said, uh, let's go to your bedroom, we'll practice there. And literally went and practice the question. It, it was a question in a game. It was like, guess who or something. And literally just practiced standing in the hallway of her door, answering the question, coming one step back, asking the same question again, one step back, asking the same question again, one step back, asking the same question again, till she was literally next to me at the table again. The friend popped the question again, and this time she was able to answer it. So that initial failure could have really soured everything. But having a plan B, which dilutes the exposure, uh, makes all the difference. So it's the flexibility to lower the exposure or increase it. And you just need practice at kind of trying to do that on your own of where, where you set the bar. Uh, I'll give you an example of another exposure hierarchy. Uh, I went to another country to treat a kid. And uh, it was a Muslim country, so we went to the family gathering on uh, Saturday, we walk into the grandparents' house and uh, there's a swarm of about 40 or 50 well-intentioned people greeting us at the door. It was, uh, it was unexpected on my part. Uh, it was a lovely family. I said to them, guys, I love you all. I don't even know you and I love you. And we're gonna have a great day, but what I need you to do now is go into the big living room. And then we did what we had planned to do, which is to play restaurant, predicated on the fact that the child and I already did restaurant playing quite a bit. We did it with a brother, we did it with a teacher, we did it with people at school. And I said to her, who would be the easiest of your family to invite to be the first <coughs> guest in our restaurant? And she picked one of her, one of her uncles. And he came in and we did it one at a time. So he was the first guest we served. But again, it was predicated on a very rehearsed script. I don't know if you've ever acted in a play, but if you have, you only do it after you've rehearsed the play. Can you imagine like putting on a play, selling tickets, inviting everybody, and like not having a rehearsal? Can you imagine the anxiety? Um, I'll tell you an interesting anecdote. I, I, uh, it turns out I don't have selective mutism. I know that's a huge surprise. Um, and I like to perform. In high school, I played uh, guitar. And we had our first big uh, folk concert. But I had never rehearsed in that space with 500 people staring at me. So I managed to combine all eight verses of a song into one verse. Um, 
I think if I had rehearsed with the live audience, it probably would have helped. My brother, by the way, yelled at great advice, which was play your other song, which I did, and things went better when I played the other song. But rehearsal, rehearsal is key. And we want it to be overly rehearsed so that it's muscle memory. I know with the student I'm here working with that she can play Uno with any combination of cards. None of it will take her by surprise. She knows what a reverse is. She knows what a skip is. She's tolerated getting the plus two card and the plus four card. She knows the difference between the nine and the six. There ain't no surprises. So what you want to do is eliminate surprise as much as possible. Now think about how many times you've prompted your kids to talk to somebody in public where there was no rehearsal. I would say unless you've rehearsed it, unless you can articulate to me why you think your child can successfully talk to that person, you have no business asking them to talk to that person. As you move along, you might purposely want to do unrehearsed things, but that's as you move along. In the beginning stages, it has to be so rehearsed that it's, that it's what we call overlearned. Just like they've overlearned the habit of not talking in the first place. Um, places to practice exposure is anywhere and everywhere. Let me kind of throw this out to you guys. If you were at a, a gas station filling up, what would be a possible exposure? Have you done a gas station exposure? Anybody? No. We're having them pay. Having them pay? Asking directions. Asking directions is a great one. Do we have a way to get the questions from people online? Yeah, let me just tell you. Okay. So I'm going to ask uh, Sarah, who's helping me with this, to um, try and see if you guys who are in the audience have any uh, questions online. Okay. So let me entertain your questions. We've been doing some rewards with our son, and but it got out of control. And obviously, we weren't. You know, this was somebody who says psychologists who recommended this to us, but it started to get to be like money, and then computer games and right so that's not really a good reward because it puts it in this room and it's quiet so managing the rewards has been a challenge for us. so choosing and managing rewards is an interesting issue i think if you get thing rewards we're seeing a lot of funny things on the screen i think if you get things thing rewards that are big then earning access to that reward is the reward. Because once you've given the thing, then you sort of don't have it as a reward anymore. I'm not bothered by rewards that have your kids going into their room on screen time. Uh, there's nothing about that, that that bothers me. If isolating themselves is a problem and we need to deal with that therapeutically, great. But if getting a little bit of downtime after you've worked so hard at a SM exposure, uh, is rewarded with downtime and isolating time, I, I, I'm okay with that. You get some questions? Sure, I have a couple questions for you. Back to tools. Um, what do you keep in your toolbox for ex of exposures for older kids? Same with rewards. So um, the strategies that uh, colleagues have used with older kids, is joining them in in their activities so their equivalent of uh, the of spotted and um, uno is the things that they're interested in most of the older kids have favorite youtube channel people um, most of them have favorite websites most of them have favorite video games it's meeting them where they're at it happens that with the younger kids where they're at is Uno and favorites and that kind of thing. But meeting older kids where they're at is just watching what they do with their free time. And unless it's inappropriate, it's joining them with that and then getting other people to do that. You may have to teach a grandparent who's feeling 
ostracized or isolated, how to just be with your kid. The way to do it is to model it, to invite them in just to watch it. So our progression would be that whoever is, has a verbal relationship with the child is using that medium to have the relationship and to do the talking and inviting the other person to come into that first as a just watching it. And then you can literally feed the lines to that person. You know, Grandpa, ask Mikey which his favorite YouTuber is. Having rehearsed that Grandpa's going to ask you who your favorite YouTuber is. That's meeting them where they're at. And the rewards tend to be more privileges kinds of things than yeah. uh, tchotchkes, you know, than things you buy in, in, a, in a dollar store. There's some good questions you're going to like. Um, one person said, I can completely see the rationale, rationale of exposure. Should I be concerned that my child might feel stressed about pleasing to parents or performing? So the question was, do we put pressure on the kids to feel like they have to please you? Um, kids do feel pressured with this. I think if they don't, my view is not the only view in, in the world of mental health folks and, and professionals who deal with that side. But my view, both philosophically and I think based on the research as I get it, is exposure requires exposure. If you had somebody who's afraid of dogs, if you had somebody who's afraid of dentists, nobody has ever been treated for a dog phobia or a dental phobia by not going near dogs and going to dentists. So very predictably, your kids are going to look more anxious or resentful or give pushback. If it was that easy, you probably wouldn't need people like me to do it. So if they're doing it to please to begin with, that's fine. They're not ultimately going to stay doing it uh, just to please you. I have a few more that I think you're going to like. Um, there's a question about whispering, and I know you've talked about this before. So if a child will, I know, if a child will whisper to his teacher, but only out of earshot of peers, I think that's a common one. Um, and then if, they, if they're only talking in whispers. Um, another person is good at talking around people at school, um, a five-year-old, but won't talk to people. So maybe if you could tackle those two. Uh, I am, uh, my religion is, uh, a whisperite. Yeah, I know it's a new religion. I believe that whispering is okay. Um, I've never had a kid ever, ever, ever who stayed a chronic whisperer forever. The boy I described to you before who uh, was probably my most severe SM and behaviorally disrupted kid who had stopped talking to his parents, who was on the heavy dose of medicine, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he was a whisperer for about three years. And I hung in there believing that that would resolve itself. And it did. And he, he was like a state competitor on his math Olympiad team. And he's off to college doing just fine. Many people that have been trained by me will take time to try and get kids from whispering to voicing. Um, I just don't like the odds. I don't like the odds of having a kid feel like they're being punished for what they're eking out. And what I know that they would tell you if they could is that when they're whispering, they actually feel like they're yelling. I've heard this anecdote more than once that somebody was talking almost inaudibly, but they thought they were yelling. Um, so I find that very, very interesting. Um, there's interesting work from speech and language pathologist Cesar Ruiz at LaSalle University who purposely starts with whispering. Turns out, by the way, and unless you're a speech language pathologist, you probably don't know this, but whispering and voicing are different muscles. It's different architecture, how you get that out. So he actually programmatically starts with whispering, which is what's called voiceless, and then moves into voicing. But for most kids you work with, if you say to them, you're whispering, can you say it louder? They'll whisper louder. <laughs> And if you try this when you're driving home later, try going, try whispering louder versus talking softly. It's much easier to talk softly than it is to whisper louder. Mm -hmm. So I tend to discourage people from caring about whispering. Now, the issue of talking only with a cupped ear and vigilantly scanning to see if anybody can hear you, that is something we can shape. So for example, we can say to a kid, you can practice 
by cupping my ear. But the points only count when you're not cupping my ear, if a child is ready for that. But one person's cupping is progress, and another person's cupping of the ear is holding them back from progress. So whatever level you tell me the child is at, I could think of how to move forward from there. I had a teacher uh, that I worked with, and I said, when you do your morning meeting today, say to the kids, I know usually I ask for volunteers. Today, I'm gonna to call on you and you can either answer from where you are or you can come up and tell me. Because I knew with 100% certainty that my student, who had never verbalized in class before, other than in the back of the room with the teacher or with peers, was certainly not gonna sit where you guys are sitting and participate. But I knew that she would come up and whisper it in her ear. And then I could move from whispering to standing six inches away, uh, 12 inches away. I remember a technique that I learned from uh, Dr. Shippen Blum with a family that she had treated was, first they worked with a paper towel, I mean a, a toilet paper roll, which is about this long, and then a paper towel roll, which is about a foot long, and then a gift paper roll, which is about three feet long. And I thought it was a beautiful shaping paradigm. But I had to break it down even further by co-holding the paper, the, each of these roles with the parent. So I had one hand on it, and the parent had one, and it went from the parent's ear to my ear, and then the parent let it go. So that's having to take down the shaping to smaller and smaller increments. Dr. Kurtz, a lot of the questions we see on the Facebook page, and we're getting some knowledge again about older kids. Um, I think these, I think these are kind of good. For example, what are some higher level goals after someone might be verbal in an area, um, such as initiation, self-advocacy? Um, and then there's another question here. My nine-year-old daughter is in denial that she has SM and says she can talk if she wants to. Um, so how do we under, how do we get her to understand that she has SM? and it's important to work on it. So I know those are. Uh, I'm gonna go with the first question first okay. and then circle back to the uh, denial, if you will. Um, it's, a, it's appropriate to expect a teenager to be able to go and talk to a teacher about their grades. It's appropriate to expect a teenager to go and ask for extra help. It's appropriate to expect a teenager or young adult to be able to go on a job interview. Um, it's appropriate to expect a teenager, young adult to be able to call the pizza place to have pizza delivered or to call the library and ask what time it's open till. Um, you mentioned as we were going on air, uh, the memoir is written and published uh, by John Colmeyer called Learning to Play the Game. I'll take a copy of it just to hold it up. And he was so kind to send it out uh, there John, Thank you for sending a Thank couple you, of <laughs> sending a couple of copies for us to give away here. Really, a, a super interesting read. Somebody's very thoughtful experience growing up overcoming SM. Um, what he recalls in the memoirs, I think, is when I went to his house in middle school, and I said to him, um, "So, what do you want to be when you grow up?" Because he was kind of stacking it with where he was with his teenage goals, and he said, "I want to be a financial advisor, like my dad." I said, well, I have good news and bad news. Which do you want first? So the good news is you're probably smarter than your dad, and you'll probably be very, very good at it. <laughs> but the bad news is that if you can't talk to clients, you will not be a financial advisor. You'll be an unemployed financial advisor. Uh, and that day, I had him call the local library to ask what time they close. And he said, that's stupid. Why do I have to do that? I said, you have to do it so that you can see whether or not this is still getting in your way in life. Um, and, the, and I know he writes about it in the book. It was, a, it was an impressive moment. Um, so I think the goals appropriately are higher order. You think about what is it that typically developing teams are doing, and you want ultimately to have the goals be no different for them. But unlike typically developing teams, they need practice at all of that. So it may mean that somebody's got to be doing role plays with them before they go into school being expected to actually do it. You can have a coworker who plays the part. You can have another therapist who comes in and plays the part. You can have 
uh, a friend of yours who plays the part, but they need rehearsal before you can expect them to go in and say to Mr. So-and-so, I think you were unfairly marking my, my essay, or how can I get some extra help for the science problems I don't understand? With regard to kids who are in denial, um, one of the people who's a, a legendary in the field of child anxiety is a guy named Phil Kendall. He developed what's considered the gold standard anxiety treatment called Coping Cat for young kids with uh, more general kinds of anxiety. And the task kids have to do in there are called stick tasks, S-T-I-C, which is show that I can. And basically, we don't get to an argument with kids whether or not they can't do something. We just say show that you can do it. Um, but it can be tough, and I, I hesitate to give uh, advice about a situation that sounds very painful that I don't know more about. But um, you can't collude with your kids in, in avoiding. Uh, so some combination of being firm and limit setting. You know, if you had a kid, to use a diabetes analogy, a kid with diabetes who said, I'm not going to take the insulin. Insulin is, is life-threatening for them. They, they have to learn to take it. So I think a compassionate response, and again, what uh, to borrow from what Ellie Lebowitz did up at Yale, he worked with parents with kids who were refusing treatment. And what he got them to do is stop doing what in that work they call accommodating. Um, I know I have an educational advocate and parents. When I say the word accommodating, you usually think of it as a positive thing. Accommodations are a good thing. They're in 504 plans. Mm -hmm. But in the world of OCD treatment, accommodating is what we otherwise call enabling, and it's not a good thing. So the nine-year-old who is in a bit of denial, I would want to make sure the parent is not inadvertently doing too many things for them. I'm not looking to make life miserable for that kid, but I certainly don't want to make it easier to continue to, to be impaired. Yes? Follow on to that older child. So I'm going to power. I'm going to paraphrase your child has altar voices and does some things that very good at altar voices. I love that I have a catalog of altar voices. We have uh, babies and cats and dogs. My favorite was the ventriloquist who could speak without exposing her teeth. But they're all ways of avoidance. Um, so I, I approach them as, as avoidance. But if in using an altar voice, they're able to participate in morning meeting. If in using an altar voice, they're able to give a book report. Then I just worry about that later. I'm, I'm confident because I've done this for so long, I'm confident that a lot of these distractions do work themselves out. So I, I tend not to get hung up about those. We've started using a sticker chart with my six-year-old again in the classroom and at home because it was effective when he was in his intensive sessions and he took a lot of pride in that. And his teacher had really been focusing on the negative behaviors and just failing to see any positive in the day. And we've seen a big improvement in that. Are those stickers, <clears throat> are the stickers enough? Like, is that the tracking system that we should then say, oh my gosh, you got 20 stickers, let's do this? Because we've just sort of been rolling with the stickers and he counts them every day and he's very happy and satisfied with that. But I worry that that's gonna lose its novelty and that we may need to kind of up the ante with that reward system. Um, drugs that you have to take more and more of to get the same effect, that's considered usually a bad thing, right? Um, I don't see kids needing more and more with stickers. I see them needing the stickers less and less as they experience that they can actually do the exposures. Um, this morning, ironically, um, the parent, me, and the kid all forgot to pack her 
exposure sheet or, or check sheet on the way to school. Um, I mean, I quickly drew circles with her and wrote her name on it with her, and we and we made that. But even between yesterday and today, I wasn't relying on stickers. Kids tend to wean off of them. Uh, would you like to hear the cutest story ever about stickers and points and prices? Mm -hmm. So I had a boy I was working with. He was a young boy. Um, he was a he was difficult to get motivated, but we got there. A couple of years later, when we were making the website, oh no, a couple of years later, I invited him to be a, a junior junior counselor and help with check in at the morning of our camp. So he would ask the parents, what's your child's name? And did they bring their lunch today or not? And do you have their permission slip for the zoo? <clears throat> About 10 minutes in, I remembered, I forgot to tell him, tell the parents. Is this the right order? Oh yeah, tell the parents that uh, parent training will be on the uh, sixth floor, but they should wait on the third floor in the cafe until uh, 9.30 or 10, whenever the start was. And he said, no. I said, what do you mean, no? He said, too many words. I said, fine, what if I pay you $6 instead of $5? He said, okay. And then he, then he proceeded to tell the parents, because we had to go, one more dollar. We, we had negotiated $5. I thought that was, that was fair. A couple of years later, it's 2015, and we were asking kids who'd been through treatment to help be actors in the videos that are on the website I was telling you about before, uh, selectivemutismlearning.org. So I called his mom up and I said, we'd love for him to help us out. She said, listen, I don't think um, candy and stickers is going to do it anymore. <laughs> and I thought, I really helped this kid. And so what I, that was my thought bubble. I said, tell him I expect him to come help us out. And he didn't get any, he didn't get actors equity pay. He didn't get any pay. So even there with an attempt to be extortionistic about it, I, I've just done this so many times that you don't see kids abusing it. What it, what it implies, to, what I infer from this is they want to get better. And if you give them the tools and a little bit of extra motivation, uh, they'll do it. After a little bit of a while, the successes they're having is the reinforcement. Now, I like a good ceremonial thing as much as anybody you know if i accomplish a big goal i may go out for a celebratory dinner but don't th i don't think for a minute that if i didn't promise myself the celebratory dinner that i wouldn't have done the important goal so at a certain point the points and prizes which are actually critical to the mission are really just celebratory um we have two minutes left i guess i'll take one more question i was just going to ask about how do you do an exposure or practice about like going to the dentist with your SM child? Good, good question. So the question is how to do exposures around going to the dentist. Yes. For those of you, uh, most of you, if you're getting professional help, many of you, you've seen the Selective Mutism Questionnaire. It's used by a lot of us. Lindsay Bergman at UCLA developed it, and she kindly offers it to all of us in the community for free. Thank you, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the items in school, in the community, is not talking to doctors and dentists. Yes. So it's a fairly common experience. Um, using this technology of exposures, you have to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And most doctors and dentists will understand that. They're frustrated as well that your kids are talking to them. Um, you know who gets most frustrated that kids don't talk to them? The directors of schools, the principals, oh, yeah. they're the most frustrated because they think that they're really, really, really nice. And most kids do find them nice. But, so they get really frustrated. When are they going to talk to me, they ask. Um, anyway, rehearsal is the only way to do it. So you need to find out what the exam is going to include and what it's not. Um, I work with a lot of kids who are anxious about medical exams, nothing to do with SM. And... Uh, you know, I need to know, are they going to get shots? Is it going to be a physical exam? Are uh, they going to have to take their, their shirt off or whatever? So making the whole thing a, a rehearsal and as predictable as possible. The other really cool technique that um, hasn't been used enough by all of us in the community 
is video modeling. So having, uh, you can go to the doctor's office, the dentist's office, and ask them on camera, what are some things you're gonna to wanna to know from my child? You can take them asking that, your child can practice answering that. Uh, so that's a, an underused technique. But with any exposure to me, it's giving your child ample rehearsal and enough external motivation that they can actually actually do it. Just one more question, like about that, the exposure. My son is very quick to scream and tantrum, stop talking to me or stop talking about it. How much do you push with those exposures I'll, before I'll, you just sort of? Yeah, I'll end with this question. The question was, my, as you stated it, because I would not use these words. My child tantrums, uh, to make the exposure go away. So um, the reason I resist the word tantruming is because I think it's just a fight or flight response. You might say to me, my kid tantrums too much anyway, in which case we could talk about oppositional defiant disorder. Do you want to make the argument that your kid has OD oppositional defiant disorder? No. no. The tantrum is in relation to a fight or flight response. So I think you don't back down from the intent to do an exposure, it's perfectly appropriate to back down from the intensity of the exposure and say, I can see maybe we bit off more than we could chew here. I love you very much. And I see that you're very scared to do blank, but I'm confident you can do blank and I'm gonna help you by blanking. Now I happened to go all chips in yesterday in this library exposure, because I was, this is what I do, I'm, I, I, I can handle that. But I wouldn't suggest you do that because you're not good enough yet at knowing when to when to back off so i would acknowledge it i could say see you're upset i love you very much i know it's very hard for you to blank but i'm confident you can blank and i'm going to help you by and how you help them may be that you leave go home and rehearse it i have great video i use when i do longer trainings uh being with the kid in a candy store we had done all the stuff kurt says to do i'm kurtz i know how to do this and still when we got into the candy store the kid couldn't say the rehearsed lines we went to the vestibule of the candy store. We practiced there. We inched one step closer, repeating the simple phrase. I even forget what it was now. And then she was able to do it. So tantruming is communication. You know, it's communication that I'm drowning. And you want to help the kid learn to swim. So you don't stop the swimming lessons because they're tantruming, because learning how to swim is a life skill. Um, this has been great fun. I've never done a Facebook Live event before. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I've had fun. I think it's been able to be both in this world and, and that world. So we're going to uh, end this live video stream. If you want to get a hold of me, uh, it's kurtzpsychology.com. Our free online web course is selectivemutismlearning.org with uh, no spaces or things between that. So thank you Thanks, all. Dr. Kurt. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.